Um, so Jeff, uh, Jeff is an associate professor of Raza Studies and Education at San Francisco State University. He is also the founder of Roses in Concrete Community School, which is a community responsive lab school in East Oakland. Uh, he's the founder of the Teaching Excellence Network and, in case that wasn't enough, the Community Responsive, uh, responsive Education Group. He's also worked with Google.org frequently over the years, and uh, several members of that team are here today. They were really excited to get to see him again, which is always a good sign. Uh, as a classroom teacher and a school leader in East Oakland for the past 24 years, his pedagogy has been widely studied and acclaimed for producing uncommon levels of social and academic success for his students. Uh, Dr. Duncan Andrade lectures around the world and has authored two books and numerous journal articles and book chapters on effective practices in schools. In 2015, he was tapped to be a commissioner on the National Commission on Teaching and America's Future. And in 2016, was part of a group of educators invited to the White House on National Teacher Appreciation Day. That's gonna be a theme amongst our keynote speakers of today. Um, he was invited by President Obama. Duncan Andrade has also been ranked as one of the nation's most influential scholars by Ed Week's public influence rankings over the past three years. His research interests and publications span the areas of urban schooling, and curriculum change, urban teacher development and retention, critical pedagogy, and cultural and ethnic studies. He works closely with teachers, school site leaders, union leaders, and school district officials to help them develop classroom practices and school cultures that foster confidence, uh, self-esteem, and academic success among all students. He holds a PhD in social and cultural studies and education, and a Bachelor of Arts degree in Literature, both from UC Berkeley. So thank you so much uh, to Jeff, and please welcome. Good morning. That's way better than my high school class. Um, <clears throat> so the, the talk that I was asked to, to do today uh, is really emerged uh, probably about 18 months ago as the result of uh, work that I've been doing for the last five to seven years uh, pretty consistently, um, which is I, I'm consistently getting called by districts, by schools, by um, charter groups, uh, by orgs like Google, um, like Facebook, to um, help them think through their equity plans or their equity efforts. So I'm in a room full of educators and I'm quite certain that your district or um, school group is also now all about equity. Um, because this is all the rage all over the country, right? We're gonna, we're gonna do equity. So the first thing that I uh, typically say to people is that if you have an equity office or an equity officer, then you know you don't have equity. Um, because equity uh, is everybody on deck all the time. Everybody's an equity officer or nobody's an equity officer. Okay? Now, you, you got to start somewhere, right? So you're probably going to start with an equity officer or an equity office or an equity plan. And this is usually the place where I get inserted. So I get asked to be a thought partner, a consultant, uh, a co-constructor of district's equity plans. And so I've been doing this now for, for quite some time, and it got to the point where it was so common that when I was having these conversations and reading these strategic plans, that I would see these two words used interchangeably, that I decided that I wanted to, um, to develop a talk that helped people disentangle the concept of equality and equity, okay? Um, because equality and equity are fundamentally different. And what I find in a lot of schools that are saying they're trying to pivot towards equity, uh, they use these terms interchangeably because they haven't actually spent the time to understand what equity means and how fundamentally different an equitable approach to schooling in this nation would be than an equal education system. Now, how do we even land on a conversation 
about an equal education system? What's the, the, the Supreme Court decision? Okay, Brown v. Board, what year is that? 1954. Okay, Brown v. Board. Brown v. Board, Supreme Court decision legislated okay, against another Supreme Court decision. So we had to say, right, that we were committed to equality because why? Because we were committed to inequality before, formally, right? And what Supreme Court decision was that? Okay, Plessy v. Ferguson. Plessy v. Ferguson, Supreme Court decision legislated racial segregation as the law of the land, right? Plessy said, the Plessy decision said that separate is equal. That's why we have Brown. So we get to 1954 and the Brown decision says, no, separate by definition is unequal. We are now in 2017. So six plus decades of a national commitment to an equal education system. To desegregated, racially desegregated education system. Six decades, highest policy body in the land has said that racial segregation in schools is illegal. Six decades plus in, any guesses on how much progress we've made on racially desegregating city schools? You just jumped right in with the settle, okay? Negative. Okay. Negative, you see, what? <laughs> you think it's gone backwards. Let's do the price is right. You can't actually bid negative on the price is right, so you're out. <laughs> Anybody think we've made any progress? 5%, 10%, okay, you, you, your hand went up, okay, you're in the game now. Yeah, you brought yourself in the game, okay, how, what do you think, how much? 5%, 10%, 20%, 10%, okay, anybody want to go higher? 20%, racial desegregation. 21%. 21, yeah, now we got the game going, now I got the game going, okay. No, you're right. Negative. No, you didn't say negative. You said zero. Said oh, okay. All right. You're right. You win. Okay. <laughs> it's the new price is right. City schools are more racially segregated now than they were before the Supreme Court said that's illegal. There's a man named Gary Orfield who's considered one of the nation's leading educational historians, uh, lawyer by trade. He's at UCLA. He was at Harvard for a long time. When he started this project, he started the Harvard Civil Rights Project, which every, uh, on, on every decade anniversary of the Brown decision, his research team releases a report that tracks the progress of our efforts to racially desegregate schools. On the 60th anniversary of Brown, he's, ne he's now at UCLA, so of course the project is now called the UCLA Civil Rights Project. Uh, and on the 60th anniversary of Brown, they released their latest, latest report, and the data reveals that schools are now more racially segregated. We've gone backwards. That, y'all, is the value of a policy. We cannot policy our way out of this. Now, that doesn't mean policy doesn't matter. Okay, y'all are educators. I'm a 25-year vet of the classroom. I know policy matters. I know my life was very different when we had no child left behind okay, than it was before we had no child left behind. There's always been a bunch of children left behind. Okay. <laughs> so the pivot from an equal education system, which we have failed miserably at, and everyone in this room knows because it's the worst kept secret in the country. Everyone in this room knows. That wealthy children, middle class children, that attend public schools, attend public schools that are fundamentally different than the schools that poor children attend, the children of color attend. Everyone knows that. An equality, an equal education system is like Sesame Street shit. One for you, one for me, one for you, one for me. And we haven't even pulled that off. And now we're talking about pivoting to equity. 
Now, equity is a much different, much more complex lift. So if you go move to equity, you got to first really invest in understanding the difference between an equal education system and what it's produced for us, okay, and an equitable education system and what its potential is to produce for us. Right. Now, the way I've come to understand this in probably the, at the deepest level of my understanding is because I have a live experiment in my home about the difference between equality and equity because I have twin boys. These are my sons, Amaru and Tayari. And I, I shit you not, I'm not making this up. I, I dare you to even try to make this up. Last night, I, I'm on the phone because I'm, if you look at my car right now, you're going to see a suitcase because I flew in last night and then, yeah, all that, okay? So I'm on the phone with my son, okay, um, on my travels home, and he says, he's, he's about to go to bed, and, he, and I said, well, what are you doing, son? And he said, I'm asking Google if Han Solo and the Millennium Falcon and stormtroopers and Princess Leia can all be friends. Okay? And I said, you're asking who? And he said, th then he quotes Bush. He says, the Google. <laughs> and I said, son, I'm probably not going to be there in the morning when you wake up. And he says, why not? And I said, because I'm going to the Google. <laughs> And he's so juiced. Okay? And then I get out the house this morning, and this is partially the reason why I'm late, and I forgot my belt. And I get down the block, and I'm like, oh, shit, I forgot my belt. And my pants are falling down. I can't be at the Google with my pants falling down. <laughs> so I go back to the house to get my belt, and my sons are there. And my son runs up to me. He's no, like, Daddy, it's, I have to. He's like, did you go to the Google? And I said, no, son, I'm going to the, and he says, daddy, take a picture with the Google. Okay, so y'all have Googlers, you got to help me figure out, like, what does that actually mean? How do you, he, he thinks the Google is a person. Okay, so I need a person, otherwise my son's going to be really confused. Okay, so this is, this is my life, okay, this is my experiment around, okay, the difference between equality and equity. Now, the boy that I'm talking about is Amaru, okay? And Amaru is constantly thirsty, so much so that this dude literally will drop a straw into anything to try to extract liquid, okay? In this particular case, he struck gold. That's a coconut he's got a straw in. And Tayari is constantly hungry, okay? So much so that this dude will literally store morsels of food on his shirt for later snacking. <laughs> This is a picture of our family, first time out the house, literally, first time out the house after the boys were born. Anybody here have multiples? Okay, so you know exactly what I'm talking about. That's real talk, isn't it? That's literally the first time we made it out of the house. Everybody else is like, oh, come, no, for real. Okay. So we're at, uh, anybody here from Oakland? Okay, so, so y'all would know that this, this is the lake, right? This is Lake Merritt, very common. Uh, gathering place for folks from the community. So we're out at the lake, and community members walk up and say, hey, 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 can you take a picture of the family? It's our first time out. Can you take so he snaps this photo and hands me my phone back. And I'm looking at the phone, put the boys down, looking at the phone, and I'm like, what the hell is that? <laughs> I said, Tayari, come here, boy, come here. I call him over, and that is bark from that tree. <laughs> So when I tell you that my son is constantly hungry, we're literally talking about a young brother that will pull bark off of trees and eat it. Okay, so in this context, is this equal? Okay, so you, you, went, you, went, right, you went right to no, okay? So wh why do you say no? Whoa, 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 whoa. Is this equal? Yes. Oh, now you want to change your answer. 
Just make sure you let kids do the same thing. Okay. So anybody here say this is not equal? Okay, in the back. Why do you say this is not equal? They're getting the same thing, but they're not taking Your son that drinks will drink the whole thing, and your son that eats a lot will drink a lot. Mm. <laughs> So why is that not equal? See, your problem and your problem and all those that you went straight to know, your problem is that you ignored the question. In point of fact, you actually changed the question. You changed the question from is this equal to is this fair? But that's not what I asked you. I asked you is this equal? And this is the dictionary definition of equal. It is in every way equal. It is also unfair. And there is nothing in the definition of equality that talks about fairness. And that's why the pursuit of an equal education system in a pluralistic, multiracial democracy that is also embedded with a long history of white supremacy and male supremacy and hetero supremacy and class supremacy and radicalized inequality has created a fundamentally unequal society such that it's literally disruptive of a pluralistic multiracial democracy. <laughs> equity is the right pivot. But to pivot towards equity, you have to understand two things. One, it's not a soft pivot. It's a hard pivot. It's going to mean hard, complicated, difficult changes for you as a practitioner and for the systems that we work in. And part of the reason that that hard pivot is required of us is because of the data that six decades of an equal education system have produced. Y'all work in data-driven systems? Y'all data-driven? Okay. I think it's fantastic that we're data-driven. We should be data-driven. but. And I got here today using my Waze app, my NAV app, right? So I'm, I'm from the 3400 block in East Oakland. So from 3416 Davis Street, I had to put in 111 Java. Java. <laughs> That's power when you can like name streets. 111 Java. I put that in there, and then Waze told me where I needed to go. So what would have happened if I put in the wrong address? Y'all would still be on your Chromebooks. <laughs> but I'd still been data-driven. Huh? Because I still would have put data in. It's not about being data-driven. It's about being driven by the right data. And if you're ending up in the wrong place year after year after year with the same group of kids, what does that mean? It means you're looking at the wrong data. If you keep looking at the same data year after year after year because you're data driven and you keep ending up in the wrong location and then you blame the nav system, you're pissed at Waze because it took you to the wrong place when in fact you told Waze where to take you. If your school is missing the mark with consistently with the same group of kids, change the data you're looking at. Now here's some data for us. On six decades of a commitment to an equal education system, question mark. Okay, because it isn't even equal. It's largely unequal or unequal. But we have lots of national data on the impact of this commitment to public education in this country. And I'll start with this one, high school graduation rates. Not long before Arnie Duncan is leaving office, he was all over CNN, at MSNBC, CBS, ABC, lauding himself in the Obama administration for having created the highest high school graduation rate in the history of the United States. And at that time, I was teaching high school at Fremont High School deep East Oakland, arguably one of the 10 worst high schools in the nation. 
It's also my neighborhood high school. And I'm teaching English. And I'm listening to Arnie Duncan, the top elected official, appointed official in our field, tell me that it's better than it's ever been. And I'm at Fremont where it's worse than it's ever been in my 20 years there. And I'm like having all kinds of intellectual disconnect. But you see, the problem with me is, is that I've been trained in the same institutions as Arnie was trained in. And so I don't get fooled by presentations of data, because this isn't data. This is a presentation of data. And so we went and got the data. And this isn't actually the map that Arnie presented. This is a re-rendition of the map with one control group. All we did was control for one factor, income. So we split the map and we said, OK, what are the high school graduation patterns for kids that don't live in poverty? So this okay, is actually for non-low income students. That's the high school graduation pattern. Does this shock anybody? Probably not, because public schools in this country have pretty consistently and effectively served the needs of middle and upper income kids. That's the graduation map for kids living in poverty. Didn't control for race. We could do this map for race, and it looked pretty much like this for black and brown kids. But we just controlled for income. And I know what y'all are thinking. Texas? <laughs> Anybody here from Texas? Okay. Uh-oh. I better get <laughs> better kill all my Texas jokes. Normally in California, those go over really well. <laughs> I'm a mixed company right now. Texas cheats. Y'all okay. got caught. <laughs> send, send them to the White House, send them right back to Texas. Right. Kentucky. Anybody here from Kentucky? We'll bang on Kentucky then. We'll leave Texas alone. <laughs> this is still a display of data. Okay. It still deserves to be interrogated, right? Is Texas actually doing better with poor kids or are they manipulating their data, right? And the Texas educators themselves are like, hell no, we ain't doing no better with poor kids. And we, of course, we know this, right? But if this is not a national crisis, pray tell what is. The group of children around the nation that most need public schools to serve them well are being failed across the board, Texas and Kentucky excluded. <laughs> That's a national crisis if we are actually aiming to be a pluralistic multiracial democracy. Because this is the map of a social apartheid. This is radicalized inequality that is so embedded across the nation that it's interruptive of a pluralistic multiracial democracy. This is our national income data. This is not from some progressive think tank. This is actually uh, Congressional Budget Office data. The United States is the most unequal society, not in the world, in the history of the industrialized world. We are the historical global champs at income inequality. This is the corresponding map for incarceration. We are not only the global champs at income inequality, we're also the global champs at locking up our own citizens. No country in the world locks up more of its own citizens per capita than the United States. In point of fact, no one's even close. Not, not raw in. I'm not talking about raw numbers. I'm talking about per capita. We lock up more than anybody else. The second closest nation state is Russia. And they're not even close to us. There's a great website called Debt to Society that's run by Mother Jones that tracks incarceration expenditures, investments, and patterns all over the world. It's a good uh, point of entry into discussions about where we're investing 
and where we're not investing in this country and what the rest of the world looks like. This is the Global Peace Index. The Global Peace Index, like any index, is worthy of critique and analysis. Okay. Certainly some things missing, but just by way of kind of like tr truthing, right? How legit is this index? The Global Peace Index is used as the primary index of peace, justice, and stability by the UN, by UNESCO, and by the World Health Organization. Okay, those are about as big as you get in terms of, of global organizations that are attentive to peace in the world. Okay. And every time I put this up, the same thing that's happening right now happens, which is everybody starts looking at me and they start looking for the US in the rankings because the US is obsessed with rankings. <laughs> and you're not finding it because we're not there. We didn't make the top 15. We're 94. This is perhaps the most indicting data of our public education system that I've seen. Because we have every child in this country for eight hours a day for 13 consecutive years in their key developmental years. Research is clear about the fact that during those years that schools have a bigger influence and more time with children than their families. And yet we have produced one of the most unpeaceful societies in the world, despite all that investment. The 2016 index came out not long ago and we're trending the wrong way. We're now 103rd. And what I find particularly interesting about our ranking okay, is who's ahead of us. Nation states that we are regularly on public record for critiquing their total state of discontinuity, disarray, injustice, and lack of peace. And yet, according to the peace index that is used by the, the globe's largest and most committed organizations to studying and promoting peace, we are doing worse than them. Now, I would venture a guess that few, if any, people in this room live at 103. In point of fact, most of us in this room live somewhere around the top 20. Which means what if we're 103? What does it mean for the kids that are struggling the most in your school? Where do they live? Yeah, they live at 140. Because for us to get to 103 in the aggregate, when all these people in this room live at 20, means that somebody else is way below 103 to get us to 103. And that disconnect is what Brian Stevenson calls proximity to pain, or a lack of proximity to pain. Brian Stevenson, another uh, person that Google's made a lot of investment in. Consider the nation's uh, leading death row lawyer. For my money, has the best analysis of race going in the country. Says that the problem that we have in this society right now is that most of the people that are designing the solutions for pain aren't proximate to the pain that they're trying to relieve. And when you're not proximate to the pain, you come up with solutions that are most convenient for you, not in pain. But when you get proximate to the pain, the solutions you come up with are very, very different. But most of us are serving children that are living somewhere around 130 or 140 while we live in 20. And that disconnect leads us to create schools that disconnect the kids that most need it. How do we get proximate to the pain that we're actually trying to relieve in our service of youth and families? 1854, London, England, was on the verge of collapse. Massive outbreak of cholera. So much so that the city officials believed that they would lose the city. In the last ditch effort to save London, they sequestered the leading medical officials in the city, locked them in a room, sat them at a table and said, you're not coming out of here until you've got the solution for cholera for this city. They sat in there, knocked around ideas, strategized, whiteboarded it. 
One of the doctors sitting at the table stands up and says, this is absurd. I said, what do you mean? He says, every single solution we come up with defaults us to cholera. We're coming up with ways that we're going to live with cholera. How are we going to manage our suffering? He said, yeah. He says, I didn't sign up to be a medical doctor to live in a state of sickness. I signed up to be a medical doctor to create the conditions of wellness. And I'm okay with treating sickness, okay? but that's not the end game. The end game is total wellness. He said, well, you're not being realistic. You're not looking at the data. And I hear this said to school leaders and classroom teachers all the time. When we start talking about a radical pivot, fundamentally changing what we do on the day-to-day -day in schools, how we interact with the children that we continually fail to serve, hard pivots. I hear them told that they're not being pragmatic. That they're not looking at the data. Just like they told this medical doctor. So he looks back at his colleagues and he says, if that's what it means to be part of your medical association, I don't want to be part of your medical association. And they said, cool. Showed him the door. That medical doctor's name was John Snow. No, not that John Snow. <laughs> that John Snow. John Snow hits the streets. He becomes an ethnographer of the community he aims to serve. Study after study for the last four decades suggests that the most successful educators in service of the nation's most vulnerable youth are first and foremost ethnographers of the communities that they serve. They are on the streets when the sun go down. They're on the streets on the weekends. They're in the homes. They're in the lives of the people they aim to serve. And they're students of those families in those communities. They're researchers, just like Jon Snow. Jon Snow said, we don't have the right data. I got to get better data. So he starts interviewing everybody that he can that had cholera. And everybody that he could that didn't have cholera. And he collects data. And what Jon Snow found in his data is a researcher's dream. He found a perfect binary. He found causal. What Jon Snow found is that every single person in London that had cholera drank from that water fountain. And every single person that didn't, didn't. So Jon Snow got a saw. He cut off the handle. And cholera stopped. London was saved. Cut off the handle of an equal education system. That pump is poison. It has created one of the most radically unequal democracies that we've ever seen. Pivot to equity. The equity conversation means that if you're hungry, you get food. If you're thirsty, you get water. If you're hella thirsty, you get hella water. <laughs> In an equity paradigm, you get what you need when you need it. This is the big commitment for the pivot to equity. The mistake in Brown, 1954. A lot of folks don't know there's actually two Brown decisions. There's Brown v. Board 1 and Brown v. Board 2. Why did we have to re-legislate the legislation? Why did we need a second Brown decision? Why did the court revisit its first decision? because we weren't making any progress. They said, what the hell's going on? We legislated racial desegregation. It's not happening. What is going on? And they went back and they looked at their decision. And what they found is that in the decision, they didn't say when. They just said, we will do this. So Brown v. Board 2 produces perhaps the most famous line in the Brown decision with all deliberate speed. When? With all deliberate speed. Well, apparently that means backwards first. 
If you're going to do equity, make sure you say when you're going to do it. By when will that group of kids have a different experience in your classroom, in your school, in your programs, in your community? Because if you don't say when, then you'll just wring your hands when you don't. Because you're not on the hook for anything. You'll talk about how hard you're trying. We tried this, we tried that, we hired this person, we hired that person, no results. Very same thing we find intolerable with our children. You must produce results. We model that for them as adults in schools. We hand ring. But you put yourself on the hook when you say when you're gonna do these things. By this date, we will have this done. By this date, this data will look this way. And you may miss the mark, but now it's power that's on the hook. It's power that's accountable. And it's power that's often the least accountable for change. So put yourselves on the hook, then you earn the right, right to really push children and families to come along with us. Now, this is not anything particularly new. Okay. Maslow, 1943. 1943, okay. of all the schools that are in this room, okay, I would stake my career on this statement, that there is nothing being used in your schools that has the research base of Maslow. Seven plus decades cross-disciplinary, public health, social epidemiology, neuroscience, the medical field, child development, psychology, all agree. Yep, he's right. So if your school is both data-driven and research-based, start with Maslow. Every time you get stuck with the kid, every time you get stuck with the family, start with Maslow. Start at the base. Food, clothing, shelter, safety, basic needs. We know from all of those fields that if a kid shows up hungry, what can't they do? Okay? They can't engage. They can't engage around anything but their hunger. Right? If a kid feels unsafe, I see all these safety plans for schools, and the only thing they're talking about is physical safety. Physical safety. And what that presumes is, is that all the other layers of safety are de facto, and they're not for kids of color. They're not for language learners. They're not for girls. They're not for your lesbian, gay, trans kids. They're not. Those safeties, those identity safeties are not de facto. So physical safety is super important, but so is identity safety. Are the children safe to show up and be who they really are culturally, linguistically, sexually? Because if they're not, what can't they do? can't learn. If you're unsafe, you can't learn. We, we know this. There is no debate in the research field about these things. Okay. And yet, the transference to schools has not happened in a way that is true and authentic and embedded, wall to wall, tip to finish, edge to edge. Because okay. we push off of this and we get sucked into Pearson and Hope Mifflin and Common Core. Okay. When this is Common Core. And you know who knows this? Wealthy schools. This is where they always start. Are kids safe? Are they clothed and fed? Do they have a sense of love and belonging? Do they feel good about themselves? Basic stuff. And when the basics are met, it is a biological fact that the human being will self-actualize. If you have children in your schools if you have teachers in your schools that are not self-actualizing, we are crystal clear in the research about why. Something underneath it is unstable or under attack. It has nothing to do with whether the kid's black, brown, purple, pink, tall, short, fast or slow. What we know in the research is, is that any human being who has their basic needs under attack will not consistently self-actualize. What that means is this. No child that you serve is broken, so don't try to fix them. 
We're spending all this time trying to fix stuff that ain't broke. Did your mama ever tell you if it ain't broke? Don't fix it. Don't fix these kids. There's nothing wrong with them. There's something wrong with this society. There's something wrong with the systems we're putting them in. That's what has to be fixed. So when a kid is off the mark, hey, become a bulldozer. What we know in the research is, is the most effective teachers of vulnerable youth are bulldozers. And what I mean is, is that they figure out what's in the way and they clear it out so that the kid can be who they already are. Can you see every child that you serve as gate, as gifted and talented? Because just peep game for us. So y'all get gate programs in your schools, gifted and talented programs in your schools. Okay, just, just peep this game for a minute, okay? If this table is the gate table, okay, then they are what? They are gifted and talented. Well, what does that make the rest of y'all? Yeah, okay. Every child is gate. Not every child performs as gate. The question for us as educators is why not? Why not? If talent is equally distributed throughout the population, which is what we absolutely have landed on in all of our research in neuroscience and biology and biochemistry, talent is randomly distributed about throughout the population, why isn't success? There must be something systemically wrong with the way in which we cultivate talent and schools are a major engine in that. Okay? And the ways in which we try to cultivate talent oftentimes is by fixing kids who don't fit in in the way that's convenient for us instead of figuring out what we need to clear out of the way so that the kid can be who they already are. That is the mind shift that we make when we move to equity. Not everybody's going to get the same thing at the same time. You're going to get what you need when you need it. And the most vulnerable youth are going to need more, a lot more. This is why Eduardo Galeano says Western nation states have built the world upside down. The world upside down is where those who need the least get the most. And those who need the most get the least. And that is the working definition of our current society. We have to invert that if we're going to be a pluralistic, multiracial democracy. Those who need the most in your school must get the most. And this is going to be the hard sell. Those who need the least are going to get least. That's the hard sell. Can you convince families that have the most that it's actually good for their kid, for this kid to get more than their kid? And in a structured school where your grade has nothing to do with your grade, that's not possible. How do we create a collectivity community right, that is building our collective responsibility to one another where if you have a whole hell of a lot of food and you ain't got no food, by definition, you give it up. Right? That's a pluralistic, multiracial democracy. That's not what we're norming in schools. Right now, what we norm in schools is, is if you got the answer to the test and she don't and you give them to her, you're a cheater. cheater. Beginning in kindergarten, we norm it. You share your knowledge, you share your access to power and opportunity, you're a cheater. It's actually bad for her. She got to pull herself up by her bootstraps. Then you'll really learn the Protestant work ethic and how to, we're not building collectivity. And the research community is particularly concerned about this because of what's showing up in health and wellness data like the Peace Index. Okay? We don't have a peaceful society and schools are norming that just with basic structural day-to-day -day functioning. Now I must say about Maslow, what Maslow said himself that the rest of the nation continually ignores when they talk about his work. That Maslow did not come up with the hierarchy of needs. Maslow appropriated it. Maslow took the concept of the hierarchy of needs from the Blackfoot people, Blackfoot nation. Breath of life is what we call it in indigenous communities. It's an inverted triangle where self-actualization actually sits on the bottom. And the ultimate goal, the highest form of community and collectivity is cultural perpetuation, the passing along culture, identity, language, traditions. That's a sustainable nation state because now you must connect with people in your community to do that. You cannot do that alone. Right? 
Maslow inverts the paradigm says yes that that is the healthy society we are so far from that in 1943 we are so far from that in this nation that we actually have to start with basic we actually have built a society that we have to say you have to feed clothe shelter and protect children that's a messed up society where you actually have to say those words but that's where we're at maslow says that very clearly in his early work right he says that the blackfoot people have built a healthy sustainable society and we're headed in the wrong direction so we got to reset and say first all children must have food clothing shelter safe basic needs everybody has to have those met everybody has to have a, a sense of love and belonging everybody has to have a sense of self-love self-esteem in order for us hey, to then talk about collective culture it's important that that is re-narrated as we talk about Maslow, that this is not a Western idea, it's an indigenous idea okay, that has been largely attributed to Western science, okay, when in fact Western science got the idea from indigenous people. Now in the second part of the talk, what I want to do is armor you up to go do this work. I want you to know that the research is completely on your side. In the research community, we don't even debate this stuff anymore. We're just trying to figure out how to go from the, uh, how to close the knowing doing gap because we know we actually have really, really conclusive good research, but we're not doing it on the ground. Right? That's the gap we got to close in this generation. Okay. How do we do what we know we're supposed to do? What we find in the research is the most successful educators focus on those three things that I called out around self-actualization. Relationships, relevance, and responsibility. When the policy rain comes, they've got an umbrella. And that umbrella is called good teaching. Okay. They just throw that umbrella up and they know at the end of the day, relationships, relevance, responsibility, and my kids are going to be fine. My classroom's going to be fine. My school's going to be fine. I'm not going to get caught up in the latest, greatest ideas. Relevance excuse me, relationships, relevance, responsibility. And the research bears this out time and time again for four plus decades. So I'm gonna armor you up with some of the best research we have so that you don't even have to have the debate because it's a false debate. It's a false debate. It's a debate over ideology instead of what's good for kids. And anytime you get into an ideological debate with people who aren't moral, it ends in stalemate. And our goal with the research and our practice is to end the debate. Because we know what works, we know how it works, and we know why it works. And I want everybody leaving here armored up with the best research we have in the nation for why those things are true and with an image burned in your mind about what it looks like. So for each of these three, I'm gonna give you a live look into a classroom or a school that we worked with that are doing this as well or better than anybody else on the planet because two of them are actually going to be international okay. so we start with relationships because at the end of the day if you've taught for a day you know this okay. the end of the day teaching and learning always 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 boils down to relationships we keep trying to change the curriculum but we're not changing relationships curriculum won't save you curriculum matters right. but curriculum won't save you at the end of the day, it's going to be, can we build better relationships with the kids and the families that feel really disconnected from our institutions? So uh, Herb Cole, who is not uh, far from here, a uh, longtime faculty member at the University of San Francisco, uh, wrote this book, I Won't Learn From You. And it's one of my all-time favorite books because this is one of the only studies, uh, comprehensive studies we have of students that fail and seeing their failure as conscious and deliberate. Yeah, right. This flipped my wig, right? Because Herb says, "How many of you have kids that show up to class? You don't even know what I'm gonna ask yet. You raise, oh, you, she, she, yeah. How many of you have kids? How many of you have kids? Just show of hands. Like, all right, yeah. All the parents in the room. Okay, happy, happy Parents Day. Okay. So, how many of you have kids, students, youth? Okay. Sorry, I asked the wrong question. It's always on me. Um, that." 
show up to class, like damn near every day. And then you get to marking period, you get to grading, and you look, and they got straight up zeros in your grade book. How many of you have that kid? Okay. Herb Call says, that's your most committed student. That's some hard shit to do. <laughs> Show up every day and do nothing. <laughs> Try that one time. How many principals in the room? Principals? OK. OK, I'm going to do you dirty right now. OK. <laughs> so for all the staff members in the room, OK, here's what I want you to do. All right? The next time you have to go to staff meeting or PD led by your principal, OK, here's your goal. All right? Here's your goal. I'm getting very clear. Define goal. Right? Learn nothing. <laughs> Some of you are like, shit, that's every damn day. I'm in <laughs> Learn nothing. Okay? Herb Call called it willed not learning. He says it takes a conscious effort. You must will yourself to sit in school and not learn. Okay? And he came to understand this by interviewing the least successful students. And what he found is, is they're excellent at what they're attempting to do. And what they're attempting to do is protect themselves from us. And so they come to school every day because the other option is go to lockup. So they come to school every day with a conscious commitment that I won't learn from you. And he's like, what? that makes no sense to me. It's brilliant. But it makes no sense to me, can you? And he said, and one kid says to him, he says, I don't care what you know until I know that you care. And I know these people don't care. And it doesn't matter if we think we care. Care is not about what you think. It's about whether or not the recipient of your care feels cared about. And we've got so many kids in schools that don't feel cared about. That's the starting point. Basic needs, food, clothing, shelter, Love and belonging. Interview your least successful students. Try to understand okay, that they are actually some of your most successful students because they're achieving exactly what they set out to achieve. If we don't understand that, okay, we can't pivot them in another direction. There's wonderful research on this. Herb Cole's a great starting point. But the research goes on and on and on. This afternoon, I'm going to be down at Stanford doing some work with these folks. Robert Sapolsky, he just had a great interview on NPR. If you're an NPR fan, you can hear some of his latest work. Robert Sapolsky is considered the world's leading researcher on stress. Okay. His book, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers, is mandatory reading in every single medical field. Social epidemiology, public health, neuroscience, medicine, everybody has to read Sapolsky. I find almost no teachers have ever read it. And I actually don't recommend that you do. Okay. <laughs> Because this book is like 600 pages in six-point font. <laughs> However, okay, there is a wonderful National Geographic 30-minute documentary film on his work that is fantastic that you can get on YouTube. Okay, it's a great PD. Okay. It's called Stress the Silent Killer. Okay. Brene Brown. Many people are familiar with Brene Brown because her TED Talk blew up. Right? A lot of folks don't know that Brene Brown also wrote a New York Times bestseller called Daring Greatly, where she expands and expounds upon what you hear in her TED Talk. So if you, the TED Talk's a great primer for vulnerability and understanding the difference between sympathy and empathy. And what we see happening a lot in schools in the relationships with vulnerable youth is sympathetic relationships. So what is a sympathetic relationship? We feel sorry for them. Right. Okay. You feel sorry for them. Does anybody know what happens to you biochemically and neurologically when you have a sympathetic connection with somebody? What actually happens inside you? Anybody know? That's what you want to start understanding better. Don't understand the external portrayal. Understand what's going on inside. Because you change what's going on inside, you're going to change what's coming out. Okay? So what's going on inside your body? If I have, if I have a sympathetic connection to her, okay? I feel sorry for you. I don't know why yet, but okay. <laughs> what's going on in my brain and my biochemistry? 
Nothing. Nothing. No shifts. What's going on in her biochemistry? Nothing. It's a false connection. I'm glad I'm not you. Right? That's sympathy. What's empathy? Huh? Putting yourself, Putting yourself in someone else's shoes. How many of young people that say, I feel you? I feel you, dog. I feel you. <laughs> They're literally expressing empathy. Empathy is, I feel you. If I have an empathetic connection to her, what happens to my neural pathways and my biochemistry? Exploding. What happens to her neurochemistry? Exploding, because it's connection. I feel you. I literally feel your pain. I feel your joy. Okay? That connectedness is what Brene Brown's work has helped us understand. The false connection of sympathy right? and the vulnerability that is required to make an empathic connection. And the bio-registry that we see when you make an empathic connection is off the charts. And what's most compelling about what we find is happening in the body when you have an empathic connection is your massive release of oxytocin. The happy chemical. It is so good for your body to make empathic connections and it's so good for your body too. Okay? It's really, really good for your teachers to learn how to make deep connections with youth. Okay? It's good for their longevity in the profession. The list goes on and on and on. Nation's leading researchers all agreeing okay, about the pathway to relationships, particularly with vulnerable people and youth, and why they matter so much. Okay. There's no debate in the field. The question, the, there's no debate in the research field. The question in the practice field has to get more complex and more committed to how, when, where, and why. Now, I'm going to show you okay, a look in on a teacher's classroom who does this as well, if not better than anybody in the world. His name's Mr. Kanemori. They made a documentary film about him when he won the National Teacher of the Year in Japan. So this is also a great PD. It's called uh, Children Full of Life. Okay. Amazing, because it follows his classroom over the course of the year. And it disabuses people of the belief that National Teachers of the Year don't have conflict in their classroom. Because he's got hella beef in his classroom with the kids. He gets mad. He loses his temper. Right? He gets depressed. He gets sad. He feels like he's failing. All the range of ga the, the gambit of emotions. Right? And what he says is, is that I have the exact same things happening in my class as every other teacher in the country. The difference is that I just react differently. And I think that there's a sense that that really skilled teachers have this special pixie dust that we blow on kids. And it's all good all the time. We've got to help all our teachers understand that really good teachers, the most successful teachers, have the same beefs in their classroom as you do. They just respond differently. Okay? Don't try to end the beef. Try to learn how to turn it into teachable moments. The meaning is in the mess. And we keep trying to sanitize education. It's a human project. So by definition, it's going to be messy. So can you learn to love the mess? Because that's where the meaning lies. Now, you don't want to be messy all the time. Because then it's just messy. Right? There's got to be meaning coming out of the mess. So I'm going to introduce you to Kanamori's class as a way to literally burn in your brain okay, an image of what it looks like when a teacher's primary commitment is relationships. And we haven't tested the sound yet, so you know, see how this goes. I'm trusting you, Google. I'm trusting you. It's supposed to be technology. Late April. Okay. Ren Sueda comes to class for the first time in four days. His grandmother died. In his notebook, Ren writes about the death, the funeral, his loss. They were worried. 
They didn't know why Ren was away. Now they're moved at his pain and saddened by his loss. The letter unlocks some brutal and long hidden memories. Mifuyu has been holding down her memories for more than half her life. She'd been afraid to talk about her father. She didn't want to seem different. She paid a price. Now, at last, she feels safe enough to talk about her missing parent. They're trying to understand. They all find it painful. Some find it unbearable. <laughs> Yo Enomoto is the class spark plug, high energy, charming. Now he's remembering the death of his grandmother. そう、本当に、こう、聞く相手がいると、そうやって自分の心の中に人が住み着く。それが手紙の音のものすごく大きな意味かなと思って。That's <coughs> that's master pedagogy. But what about time on task? That's how you get the highest achievement patterns in a nation. 
relationships, not drill and kill. Because out of that empathy comes the deeper learning, the connection to the concepts and the ideas, a reason to read, a reason to write. Not for a test. No one in this room remembers your test scores. In the larger scope of your life, they're irrelevant. They matter in terms of a gateway, access to institutions and power. But in terms of building pluralistic, multiracial democracy, they have almost zero value. So what are we trying to build? And if it's the latter, then we've got to follow the research and what we know has the biggest impact on achievement and practice, which is relationships. Second is relevance. We get those kind of relationships, then it's an open question. What are we actually teaching these children? Now, I'm in a lot of schools that bring me in because they want to do some iteration of ethnic studies. They want to be culturally and community responsive, culturally relevant. I am not a big fan of checklists, but I'm going to give you one right now. If you want to check whether or not your curriculum and pedagogy in your classrooms and in your school is culturally and community relevant. Here's your checklist. Does it reflect students' lives, their communities, their families, and their ethnic, cultural, and linguistic histories? If it doesn't, the answer is no. You're not culturally and community responsive. If it does, you're on a good path. Well, what that means is that you're not going to have the same curriculum school to school to school, even in the same city, right? That's what it means to be community and culturally responsive, is to first assess who are the children and families that I serve, okay? and what is a curriculum that connects to their lives, their blocks, their families, and their ethnic, cultural, and linguistic histories. That's what it means to have a relevant education. Okay? And all of these things can be scaffolded into Common Core. One of the few upsides of Common Core is it actually opens this window for us okay, to be much more dynamic in the way in which we design and deliver curriculum. <clears throat> and of course, the research bears all this out across fields. There's no debate about whether or not cultural and community relevance matters. Here's why. First, what we know is that in classrooms where this is happening, Students have a stronger sense of self. And we know from the research, both from neuroscience and from psychology, that there is a direct connection between knowledge of self and self-esteem. Where did you see self-esteem in this presentation earlier? Maslow. Where in Maslow? It's not at the top. <laughs> right. It is the window into self-actualization. No human being consistently self-actualizes in an aspect of their life where they do not have self-love, a sense of esteem. And we're dealing with kids all over the country, particularly kids of color that have been taught to hate themselves, taught to hate the color of their skin, the texture of their hair, the color of their eyes, the language they speak, the neighborhood they come from, their family history. That has to be eradicated in schools. How many students graduate from your schools and say, I love myself? Because what we know in the research is, is that if that's said and true, because there's some kids that say they love themselves or really don't, okay? but if that's said and true, that that person is on a trajectory to success, self-love. But I find almost no schools in the country measure that. You know what that means? It doesn't matter, because we measure what matters. If love matters to you, if self-esteem matters to you, start metricing it in your classroom and your schools. And there are definitely well-tested measures for those things. We also know that there's a direct connection between self-esteem and hope. Hope has become particularly centered in conversations in the medical field around vulnerable youth, wounded youth youth exposed to high levels of trauma and toxic stress. Because what the medical field has found is that hope is the only consistent indicator that they've been able to track and measure that directly links to how well students navigate through toxic stress. 
the higher their hope levels, the more resilient they are. There is a very clear metric for hope, what you can measure. I use the children's hope scale in my high school classroom. It's the only thing I baseline is hope because I know the research. And I know if I move the meter on hope, the reading, the writing, the tests will take care of themselves. And I also know that if I teach the hell out of the reading, the writing, and the tests, and, I, and I'm not attentive to hope, that it won't move for the kids that most needed to move. Charles Schneider developed something called the Children's Hope Scale and Hope Theory. It's a very simple scale that you can use to track hope levels in your classrooms and in your schools. We know that there's a direct relationship between hope and ability to interrupt stereotype threat. How many of you have heard of stereotype threat before? A few of you? Okay, how many of you test kids in your schools? You guys, y'all don't test? I can just leave now then, you good. I test kids, I'm a teacher. I wanna know, I wanna know, do you know? I want some recall, okay? But if you're going to test kids, know the research on testing, Claude Steele. Developed a concept called stereotype threat. Because he wanted to understand how many of you have students who can do the work and then they sit exam and they choke. We now have very clear neurological science on why that happens. Okay? Here's what happens. And here's why it happens disproportionately to kids of color, poor kids, and girls. It's called stereotype threat. So what happens when you sit exam, any exam, any test that you believe is a measure of your innate ability and the stereotype about your group is that you're not innately good at it, you have a biochemical reaction that literally fires inside your brain and interrupts your neural pathways so that you literally biologically cannot recall things you know. Your neural pathways get blocked. We have crystal clear research evidence on this. So Claude was particularly interested in why this is happening for kids of color. So he releases all this research. Probably his, 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 the book I'd start you with is a book called Whistling Vivaldi. Okay. The way in which stereotype threat affects hey, kids of color is very clear to us. But the larger research community is like, Claude's at Stanford, and they're like, okay, Claude, like if that's really true, there's stereotypes about everybody, so stereotype threat will affect everybody. And Claude goes, yeah, it will. But I'm not interested in everybody. I'm focused on kids of color. Why do I have to prove it happens to white people for it to matter for people of color? You guys go prove that. Like, okay, we will. So he said, if it's true, then it'll definitely happen to women. Claude said, yep, it will. So they conducted a study with women mathematicians. Because what's the stereotype about women in math and science? Not innately good at it. Not part of your genetic makeup. So he took a group, or the, the, this research team took a group of, of women mathematicians, which means they can do what? <laughs> math. <laughs> and they took them through this series of problem sets, and they did it just fine because they're <laughs> mathematicians. <laughs> And then they sat an exam. They put the same problem sets in front of them. They said, this test will measure your innate mathematical ability. Go. And they all underperformed. They said, oh my goodness, Claude might be right. But there's one final test. Who's the final test? Which men? White men. Because okay. there are stereotypes about white men too, aren't there? White men can't jump and white men. <laughs> And she added in for extra spike, can't dance either. <laughs> white men can't jump, white men can't dance. So UCLA conducts a study with a group of, of uh, white male undergrads who were all highly accomplished high school athletes. Now a lot of people come to undergrad and say I was an accomplished high school athlete and it's not even true. Okay? <laughs> so they tested it. Indeed, these young men were all very skilled, capable, high-end athletes. And then they sat an exam. And they said, this test will measure your innate athletic ability. And guess what happened? They all underperformed. And the difference between white men and some women and kids of color is there isn't a stereotype about white men not being good at school. So when they sit exam, the biochemistry registers don't shift. 
They know they can do school. There's lots of evidence they can do school. But with kids of color, that question is always in the back of your mind. Even if you don't say this test innately measures your ability, you interview kids, you find out they think that the test measures their innate ability. So Claude is very clear about what you can do with somebody who needs to test kids to interrupt stereotype threat. Okay? And this is part of the pattern, but there are things you can do tomorrow when you sit kids' exam that you can say that will alleviate some of that neural blockage right, and will allow them to perform at the level that they're actually at. And this creates what researchers call a Pygmalion effect. Okay? The Pygmalion effect is the self-fulfilling prophecy. Right? I am whatever you say I am. Research is crystal clear that the single biggest factor impacting student achievement in a classroom. Anybody know what it is? Parent income, parent education, zip code. Teacher expectations. Teacher expectations. Study after study after study reveals this. Teacher expectations is the number one factor, and we have good research on why. Because teacher expectation creates a Pygmalion effect. You are always creating a Pygmalion effect in your classroom. That's a fact. Always. There is always a Pygmalion effect going on. Okay. The question is whether it's a positive or a negative one. Okay. The negative Pygmalion effect is you think I'm not smart, I must not be smart. The positive Pygmalion effect is you think I'm smart, I must be smart. Okay. And this is what Carol Dweck's work has lifted up for us. Now I'm in schools all over the country that are misusing Carol Dweck's work. Carol Dweck, how many of you are familiar with Carol Dweck's work? Ah, oh, yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> it's all the rage. Okay. <laughs> Have you been uh, checked out Carol's latest lectures? She's gone back on the lecture circuit to rage on schools for misusing her research. Because I'm in schools all the time and say, yeah, we're, we're, we're working on growth mindset. I'm like, oh, who are you working on that with? And they're like, the kids. We're developing kid growth mindset. Carol's like, oh, shit. <laughs> OK, let me just lay it out for you plain, right? Who needs a growth mindset? The grown-ups. Okay, the grown-ups. What Carol Dweck says very clearly in her research is that the mindset of the children reflects the mindset of the adults. So if you want to change the mindset of the children, you got to change the mindset of the adults. The growth mindset work is for the grown-ups. And when grown-ups have a growth mindset, kids come along just fine. So if you're finding children in your schools don't have growth mindset, okay, then work on the adults that are around them. And we're, we're short on time, so I'm going to blow into the third one. You're not going to get to see the Modi. Sorry. Hey, you know. Now she gave me a two-minute mark. Are you throwing up peace sign? Okay. <laughs> we're going to end with responsibility. Because at the end of the day, right, that's the driver. Right? Can we hold our responsibility? Bruce Perry is considered the nation's leading expert on child trauma. So if you are working uh, with kids that are experiencing mild to severe exposure to toxic stress, they're going to have trauma registers. Okay? Um, Bruce's book, The Boy is Raised as a Dog, is my primer when I'm working with schools that have high levels of trauma. It is awesome. His work is awesome. Um, and this book is a great PD item for teachers. You can do one chapter at a time because every chapter is an independent case study. And it will, liter <clears throat> it will literally change the way that you interact with kids that quote unquote misbehave. Because you'll read their behavior differently. And when you read behavior differently, you respond differently. If you see it as misbehavior, then you'll punish it. Okay? If you see it as the result of trauma, then you'll try to heal it. Okay? There's all kinds of neurology behind that. <clears throat> Some other light reading, just in case you get bored over the summer. Uh, Robert Putnam, Oxford calls Robert Putnam the world's most influential scholar. Okay. It's not actually Bowling Alone that I recommend. I put Bowling Alone up there because that's the one that put him on the map. He just released another book called Our Kids, which is one of the best uh, political economist analyses of the role of public schools in creating a social apartheid or a pluralistic multiracial democracy. Putnam is at Harvard's Kennedy School. He concludes that we are rapidly approaching social apartheid, if not already achieved it. Unnatural Causes is an amazing uh, film series from PBS. It, it's a, I think they now have eight uh, films out. They have a, it has a great website with tons of resources for teachers. 
It's the largest study ever connected cross discipline or ever conducted cross disciplinary on the impact of inequality. It's a global study of inequality and its relationship to health outcomes and what the, the conclusive right field to field is that the biggest threat to health on the planet is inequality. So if you want a healthy classroom or a healthy school, you have to eradicate all forms of inequality. No oppression Olympics. Okay? You got to pay attention to race. You got to pay attention to class. You got to pay attention to gender. You got to pay attention to sexual identity. You got to pay attention to xenophobia, language, all forms of inequality, odious, intolerable. And when that is what we see in schools, that's what we'll see in our society. Because if for 13 years you go to an institution where inequality is unacceptable, you become an adult that believes inequality is unacceptable. Right? But the truth is that schools are a social mirror. And the same radicalized inequality that we see in the society gets normed in schools. And then last, Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow, uh, for my money, is the best analysis of the relationship between schools and the prison system. I want every educator that I work with to understand that writing a referral on a child is not a benign act. You put pen to paper, and we have very clear evidence that there is a connection between referral and pathway to juvie. And we have very clear research evidence that there is a clear connection between the pathway to juvie and the pathway to the pen. Schools have to change the way we discipline kids because we don't. We punish them. And discipline and punishment are not the same thing. Read Michel Foucault. We have conflated those things in schools. And I guarantee you, if you start calling uh, suspension, expulsion, and re office referrals punishment, they'll go down. They'll go down. Because then you're saying, so you want to punish this kid. And people, oh, no, 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 I want to discipline them. OK, well, discipline comes from the Latin discipulus which means rigorous repetition, or rigorous training through repetition. Can you give a child rigorous rep, uh, training through repetition if they're suspended? Yeah, you can give them rigorous repetition in suspension. And that's what happens, isn't it? Okay. There is no evidence in the research field that punishment changes behavior. There is very clear evidence in the research field that discipline changes behavior. Discipline is a process of inclusion. Punishment is a process of exclusion. Do you discipline kids or do you punish them? Make sure you understand the difference. Wayne Yang wrote a great article on this for educators, Y-A-N-G. So I'm gonna end giving you a live look into my classroom, just in case you think I'm up here just talking shit. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> Which I mostly am, but, but I, actually do, I actually do the work too. Okay? I've been a teacher in my community for, two, this will be my 25th uh, year I hear I get some kind of like tinfoil watch for that this year. Um, so uh, this is um, from my uh, high school English classroom a few years back. Um, this young lady that you're going to hear from is actually my neighbor. So I literally teach my neighbor's kids. Um, she's also from the 3400 block. Um, this was at Fremont. And um, this is my second year with her. And I want you to understand that because this stuff that I'm talking about doesn't happen like that. Right? That your responsibility is a commitment over time that young people will not become who we want them to be tomorrow just because we love them a little bit harder, right? Particularly the most wounded and vulnerable youth. They're gonna show up with their wounds and their vulnerability, and the more we love them, the more they're gonna expose that to, them and expose that to us, and the harder it's gonna be to love them, because it's painful to love somebody who's wounded, right? So we gotta support each other in that work. We can't isolate teachers either. Now, I'm also going to say about this video that you're about to see that it may trigger some of you because of what she chooses to share. And if you get triggered, please take the space that you need. And if somebody at your table gets triggered, acknowledge their humanity. Check in on them. Lay hands, skin to skin. It's important. When I think about my responsibility as an educator, I think about her. And I think about this story. Cheating on my boyfriend with my ex because he would tell me he still loved me. Lying to the people I love. 
hurting the people that care about me the most, and then I will see the reason why. I will see a little girl That girl's in your class. That girl's in your school. That boy's in your class. That boy's in your school. That is not the question. The question is whether or not your school, your classroom, creates the space for them to narrate that truth and be held. She's 16 years old, she's a sophomore. She's standing in front of her peers saying that. How do we create classroom, youth cultures where they hold each other, where that doesn't become chisme, that doesn't become cyberbullying. That's not all over the bathroom walls. But instead, they're calling out, say, go, we got you. It's okay, we got you. And they're saying, go ahead, we got you, because they know they're up next. They're going to be up there telling their story. And their story looks just like her story. When young people are doing that, they're a lot less likely to sit on a trigger and point it at somebody that looks just like them. The only way you can pick up a heater and point it at somebody that looks just like you is if you hate yourself. You want to stop violence in your neighborhoods. You want to stop rape. You want to stop pillaging, violence, suffering. Center love. Create the conditions in your school where children are able to heal from their woundedness and learn to love themselves by loving others. That will transform this nation state from 103 to top 20 in peacefulness. What we do every day around love matters. I don't give a shit about your test scores. If your students leave your institution and they don't love themselves, we're building a nation full of educated Eichmanns, the creators of the collapse of the housing industry and the banking industry all went to the most elite universities in the world. That can't be the solution. We must be missing something in what we're centering. If they can read and write and do math, and then create paradigms by, whereby they exploit other people. We've got to put ourselves on the hook for that. 
How are we going to create a group of young people that will build the nation that we've rhetorically committed to, but in reality have not built at all? I'll end with the teachings of the people of this land. Teachings from the Cherokee community, which also reoccur across many indigenous communities, this, this story. It's a story about a little boy. He's out in the front yard playing around. He comes running in the house. He runs up to his abuelita, his grandma. He says, abuelita, I feel like there's a war going on inside my head. And she says, there is, mijo. He says, who's fighting, abuelita? She says, the two wolves. He says, well, who are the two wolves, abuelita? And she says, one wolf is rage, avarice, greed, selfishness, violence. He says, who's the other wolf, abuelita? She says, the other wolf is cariño, familia, love, empathy. He says, who wins, abuelita? And she says, the one you feed. Those wolves are inside every child you serve. They're inside every person in this room. They're inside every staff member you work with. They're there. We can change the wolves we're feeding in ourselves. We will change the wolves the young people are feeding. And when we do that, we're on the path of the thing that I think almost everybody in this room set out to try to build when you were dumb enough to become an educator. <laughs> If I can support you in any way on that journey, please don't hesitate to reach out. Put my contact info back up. If you want this slide deck, if you want any of the resources, if you want the second tier of resources to come after you've read all this stuff, hey, please don't hesitate to reach out. We will not build this transformation in isolation. Okay? This has to be both an individual and a collective and a national commitment to change in the way that we do education in this country. Thank you. All right, so, uh, so Jeff has been nice enough to offer to answer a few of your questions. So we'll take another few minutes and give you all an opportunity. Yeah, in the back. One of the things that we always get asked is, uh, what are some of the practical things that we can bring back, uh, even though it's a long journey, but just to start the ball rolling with some things that teachers can grab onto. Similarly to the uh, HOPE survey that you mentioned, something along those lines, and where to go to get some of those resources yeah. or exercises. <clears throat> um the, so the, the resources that I lifted up in this um, talk, when I read, read these texts, they immediately resonated for me in my classroom. Like I, I could it, apply it right now. Like, oh, it changed the way I saw certain kids. So it really depends on the problem of practice that, 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 that the educator is, is trying to unlock, right? But typically that's with, like I'm trying to figure out how to connect to this kid that I can't figure out how to connect to. Right? That's typically the biggest right, challenge that I see with teachers. This kid is disruptive, they, they won't do the work, they're, they're, they're defiant, whatever right, this, the story is. Um, and so um, depending on the context in which you teach, I would start teachers off either with Perry's book, okay? uh, Bruce Perry's book, The Boy That Was Raised as a Dog, um, because inevitably what's happening with that quote unquote defiant kid is that they're carrying a trauma load. Right? They're, their neurology and their biochemistry is all off whack because they're not feeling safe, right? And so to the degree that a teacher can understand that, um, and Perry helps you understand like what's going on inside the kid. And when you understand what's going on inside the kid, then you read the, the, the outer right, portrayal of those things differently. Um, so th the other thing that, that really impacted my uh, classroom practice a lot was Unnatural Causes, that, that film series. Because um, there's also a website that hosts it that has lots and lots of very practical curriculum resources, trainings, right, all these things that right, teachers can access. But at the end of the day, I, I think typically the advice that I give uh, to teachers that are struggling with a, a particular student is to d don't try to fix that problem in the classroom. Because you almost certainly can't. 
Um, so it's can you create the conditions to build a relationship with that child outside of the classroom? And, um, and the truth is that uh, every single teacher I've ever worked with already has the skill set they need. They're not lacking, okay? Because every teacher that you might be working with that's struggling with something, right? They have a good relationship with somebody in their life. So what is that evidence of? That they know how to build a good relationship, right? And so, so the, what's happening is, is that they're mismatching who they are in that, in that positive relationship and who are, they are with that kid that they're in conflict with. And, and because they have power in the relationship, they're wanting the kid to change first. Right? When this kid shows up properly, right? when they show up with respect, then I'll be their teacher. That's actually a violation of our moral responsibility as a teacher. In New Zealand, they actually have to sign, teachers have to sign the Hippocratic Oath. Y'all know what the Hippocratic, anybody not know what the Hippocratic Oath is? Right, that's the, the oath that doctors take and what's the like main line in there? First rule, do no harm, right? Um, and so I start there with teachers, right? That what is, right, you know how, have them analyze the best relationship they have in their life. What are the components of it? How do they act? And specifically, how do you act under conflict? Because we romanticize our relationships in, in this country. Right? We act as if conflict is a bad thing. And the truth is, is the tightest relationship you have, whether it's with your homies or with your partner or with your children, there's always conflict. And we have this story that we tell ourselves that love is the absence of conflict. Because love in this society is super Pollyannish. It's all based on the notebook. <laughs> right? Everything's going to be OK in the end. Right? No, it's not. Love is not the absence of conflict. Okay? Give this nugget to your teachers. Love is not the absence of conflict. Love is the presence of conflict with the courage, character, and commitment to find your way through. And that is the, that is the, the main divide I, I find between the most successful teachers and the least successful teachers, is the least successful teachers abhor conflict. They resent it. They want it to go away. They want no mess. And what I tell those teachers is, get an office job. If you want predictability, get the hell out of teaching. I've been teaching 25 years, and the minute I think I got it licked, I get one in the back of the head. Like, no way, how'd you get me? That girl that you heard, when she started my class, I was starting my 18th year, I had all these awards, and she's my neighbor. And one of my points of pride in my 18 years, pride cometh before the Mm hmm So here it comes. One of my points of pride was that in 18 years in deep East Oakland, I never had a fight in my class, ever. And the first day, that girl hops off a fight in my class. My damn neighbor <laughs> breaks my streak of 18 years. Right? And a lot of teachers would have resented her for that. Right? And I loved her for it because she forced me to grow. And all those awards, when I get awards, I put them in boxes because that's who I was. It's not who I'm becoming. And she reminded me that. You got to become somebody else right now because I'm in your class. <laughs> right? And a lot of teachers that have all these awards, do you know who I am? That same class, right, two years later, I was, Harvard brought me up, and me and Arnie Duncan were the keynote speakers. Arnie Duncan went first, then I went on and explained why everything he said was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so I fly back from Boston, right? I get in like two in the morning to SFO, go back to my house, and I'm, first period, I'm, at, I'm in my class teaching 11th grade English. And, this boy in my class like just gives me the 
like to the point where I literally started having homicidal thoughts about him, like in the moment, like, dude, I'm gonna kill you. Right? And my first reaction to him when he was doing this was, I, I, I almost, I almost said this. I almost said, "Do you know who I am?" <laughs> like, do, I was just with Arnie Duncan, you asshole! Like, you. <laughs> and then I remembered, he doesn't give a shit about Harvard or Arnie Duncan. He's showing up with all his woundedness. Can you hold me like this? Because you say you care about me. And what I try to get teachers to understand is the most wounded children speak the most truth, and we resent them for it. Because the most wounded children don't even try to cover it up anymore. They reveal to us the darkest corners of our society. That's what that girl told you that she showed me on the first day. I'm wounded. And I know who you think you are, 18-year vet with all your awards, your reputation ripples throughout the neighborhood, and for that reason, I'm coming in here, I'm gonna fuck up your class on the first day. <laughs> because everybody says, you're Jeff. Everybody says, you love all your students. Everybody says, you'll go to juvie, you'll go to jail, you'll go to the streets. Everybody says, but you won't do that for me. You won't do that for me, I know you won't, and I'm gonna prove it on the first day. I'm just gonna fire on this girl right here, just to see. And once we got the fight stopped, and she's waiting, and what's she waiting for? She's waiting to go to the office. She's waiting for the referral. And I said, sit your ass down. <laughs> Fuck up my 18 years. <laughs> Sit your ass down. And you know what her reaction was? She literally says, no, you have to send me to the office. And I said, I don't send people to the office. Because when I was your age, I got sent to the office. You're here because I love you. And you did some shit that makes me want to kill you. <laughs> and so we're going to have to go from kill to love. And in order for that to happen, we gonna talk. No, you gotta send me to the office. No, I don't. That's how our relationship started. And a year later, she's telling that story. Okay. Now I know how practical that is, right? Because this work ain't always practical, right? It's not clean, it's not mess. Can you coach people into the mess, right? and then create the conditions whereby they can narrate, how do I get out of this mess? Okay. Perry can give you some good stuff, unnatural causes can give you some good stuff, but at the end of the day, what I find is most teachers already know what they're supposed to do, they're just loath to do it. Because they haven't figured out how to find themselves in that child. So the practical piece I will give you is actually from my ancestors. So I come from the Opata people, which connects me to the Mayan and the Mexicayo people. And the Mayans had a, uh, a story, a principle called In La Quesh. And In La Quesh became uh, a, a, an increasingly popularized concept and term in education because of the work of the Rasa Studies program in Tucson Unified, who taught me a lot about my history and my culture and, and In La Quesh. And In La Quesh is the story of the smoking mirror. Right? We would teach all our children this idea. Right? And the idea is that Every living being that you come across is a smoking mirror. That is not the question. The question is whether or not you can muster the courage, character, and commitment to clear the smoke away. Because if you do, what will you see? You see yourself. That's the barrier for most teachers. Lisa Delpit called it in one of her books, other people's children. And as long as they're other people's children, they go to the office. As long as they're other people's children, they go to juvie. They need tough love. They need discipline. They need punishment. But if it's your son, if it's your daughter, the smoke is clear. You know, you'll try every angle, every, you ain't going to the office. There is no way in hell I'm sending Amaru or Tayari to the damn principal. They're my sons. I feel that way about every kid I teach. You are my son. You are my daughter. I am not sending you to somebody else to fix you because you're not broken. I have to figure out what's in your way. 
That is the principal teaching of all of our ancestors. And we've lost our way around that because we've been te become technocratic and mechanical in teaching. Teaching is about relationships. And relationships is about work and pain. And the deepest relationships we have are with people that we went through that pain. We cleared the smoke away. And the honest truth is that the kids that are going to be the toughest to reach are the ones with the most smoke. And that makes sense because they're on fire. Their lives are on fire. So it's going to be way more smoke to clear, harder work to find yourself in that child. But if you've taught as long as I have, you know that those are the kids that come back. They're worth it, right? But that's what we got to get, right, teachers to understand. And a lot of times it's about getting early wins, right? Don't start with the kid that's a house of fire, right? <laughs> start with the kid that's a little bit of smoke. Get an early win. Start getting some momentum. Get your confidence up that you know how to build relationships with these young people, and then we can build up to the kid that's in full-on flames. You dig? <laughs> Cool. So, unfortunately, we have now hit the end of our... <laughs> That's what happens when you ask me a question. System. Six decades. Highest policy body in the land has said that racial segregation in schools is illegal. Six decades plus in, any guesses on how much progress we've made on racially desegregating city schools? You just jumped right in with the settle. Okay? Negative. Okay. Negative. You see, what? You think it's gone backwards. Let's do the price is right. You can't actually bid negative on the price is right, so you're out. <laughs> Anybody think we've made any progress? 5%, 10%. Okay, you, you, your hand went up. Okay, you're in the game now. You brought yourself in the game. Yeah, you brought yourself in the game. Okay, how, what do you think? How much? 5%, 10%, 20%? 10%. 10%. Okay, anybody want to go higher? 20% racial desegregation. 21, yeah, now we got the game going. Now I got the game going, okay? No, you're right. Negative, no, you didn't say negative, you said zero. Oh, okay, all right, you're right, you win. Okay? It's the new price is right. City schools are more racially segregated now than they were before the Supreme Court said that's illegal. There's a man named Gary Orfield, who's considered one of the nation's leading educational historians, uh, lawyer by trade. He's at UCLA. He was at Harvard for a long time. When he started this project, he started the Harvard Civil Rights Project, which every, uh, on, on every decade anniversary of the Brown decision, his research team releases a report that tracks the progress of our efforts to racially desegregate schools. On the 60th anniversary of Brown, He's, ne he's now at UCLA, so of course the project is now called the UCLA Civil Rights Project. Uh, and, and on the 60th anniversary of Brown, they released their latest, latest report, and the data reveals that schools are now more racially segregated. We've gone backwards. That, y'all, is the value of a policy. We cannot policy our way out of this. Now, that doesn't mean policy doesn't matter. Okay, Y'all are educators. I'm a 25-year vet of the classroom. I know policy matters. I know my life was very different when we had no child left behind okay, than it was before we had no child left behind. There's always been a bunch of children left behind. Okay? <laughs> so the pivot from an equal education system, which we have failed miserably at, and everyone in this room knows, because it's the worst kept secret in the country. Everyone in this room knows that wealthy children, middle class children that attend public schools 
attend public schools that are fundamentally different. This is all the rage all over the country, right? We're gonna, we're gonna do equity. So the first thing that I uh, typically say to people is that if you have an equity office or an equity officer, then you know you don't have equity. Okay. Um, because equity uh, is everybody on deck all the time. Everybody's an equity officer or nobody's an equity officer. Okay. Now you, you gotta start somewhere, right? So you're probably gonna start with an equity officer or an equity office or an equity plan. And this is usually the place where I get inserted. So I get asked to be a thought partner, a consultant, uh, a co-constructor of district's equity plans. And so I've been doing this now for, for quite some time and it got to the point where it was so common that when I was having these conversations and reading these strategic plans that I would see these two words used interchangeably. That I decided that I wanted to, um, to develop a talk that helped people disentangle the concept of equality and equity. Okay? Um, because equality and equity are fundamentally different. And what I find in a lot of schools that are saying they're trying to pivot towards equity uh, they use these terms interchangeably because they haven't actually spent the time to understand what equity means and how fundamentally different an equitable approach to schooling in this nation would be than an equal education system. Now, how do we even land on a conversation about an equal education system? What's the, the, the Supreme Court decision? Okay, Brown v. Board, what year is that? 1954, okay, Brown v. Board. Brown v. Board, Supreme Court decision legislated okay, against another Supreme Court decision. So we had to say, right, that we were committed to equality because why? Because we were committed to inequality before, formally, right? And what Supreme Court decision was that? Okay, Plessy v. Ferguson. Plessy v. Ferguson, Supreme Court decision, legislated racial segregation as the law of the land. Right? Plessy said, the Plessy decision said that separate is equal. That's why we have Brown. So we get to 1954, and the Brown decision says, no, separate by definition is unequal. We are now in 2017. So six plus decades of a national commitment to an equal education system, to desegregated, racially desegregated education, then the schools that poor children attend, the children of color attend. Everyone knows that. And equality, an equal education system is like Sesame Street shit. One for you, one for me, one for you, one for me. And we haven't even pulled that off. And now we're talking about pivoting to equity. Equity is a much different, much more complex lift. So if you go move to equity, you got to first really invest in understanding the difference between an equal education system and what it's produced for us and an equitable education system and what its potential is to produce for us. Right. Now, the way I've come to understand this in probably the, at the deepest level of my understanding is because I have a live experiment in my home <laughs> about the difference between equality and equity because I have twin boys. These are my sons. Amaru and Tayari, and I, I shit you not, I'm not making this up. I, I dare you to even try to make this up. Last night, I, I'm on the phone, because I'm, if you look at my car right now, you're gonna see a suitcase, because I flew in last night, and then, yeah, all that, okay? So, I'm on the phone with my son, okay, um, on my travels home, and he says, he's, he's about to go to bed, and, he, and I said, well, what are you doing, son? And he said, I'm asking Google if Han Solo 
and the Millennium Falcon and Stormtroopers and Princess Leia can all be friends. <laughs> okay? And I said, you're asking who? And he said, th then he quotes Bush. He says, the Google. <laughs> and I said, son, I'm probably not going to be there in the morning when you wake up. And he says, why not? And I said, because I'm going to the Google. <laughs> And he's so juiced, right? And then I get out the house this morning, and this is partially the reason why I'm late, and I forgot my belt. And I get down the block, and I'm like, oh, shit, I forgot my belt, and my pants are falling down. I can't be at the Google with my pants falling down. So I go back to the house to get my belt, and my sons are there. And my son runs up to me. He's no, like, Daddy, it's, I have to. He's like, did you go to the Google? And I said, no, son, I'm going to the, and he says, daddy, take a picture with the Google. Okay, so y'all have Googlers, you got to help me figure out, like, what does that actually mean? How do you, he, he thinks the Google is a person. Okay, so I need a person, otherwise my son's going to be really confused. Okay, so this is, this is my life. Okay, this is my experiment around. Um, so Jeff, uh, Jeff is an associate professor of Raza Studies and Education at San Francisco State University. He is also the founder of Roses in Concrete Community School, which is a community responsive lab school in East Oakland. Uh, he's the founder of the Teaching Excellence Network and, in case that wasn't enough, the Community Responsive, uh, responsive Education Group. He's also worked with Google.org frequently over the years, and uh, several members of that team are here today. They were really excited to get to see him again, which is always a good sign. Uh, as a classroom teacher and a school leader in East Oakland for the past 24 years, his pedagogy has been widely studied and acclaimed for producing uncommon levels of social and academic success for his students. Uh, Dr. Duncan Andrade lectures around the world and has authored two books and numerous journal articles and book chapters on effective practices in schools. In 2015, he was tapped to be a commissioner on the National Commission on Teaching and America's Future. And in 2016, was part of a group of educators invited to the White House on National Teacher Appreciation Day. That's gonna be a theme amongst our keynote speakers of today. Um, he was invited by President Obama. Duncan Andrade has also been ranked as one of the nation's most influential scholars by Ed Week's public influence rankings over the past three years. His research interests and publications span the areas of urban schooling, and curriculum change, urban teacher development and retention, critical pedagogy, and cultural and ethnic studies. He works closely with teachers, school site leaders, union leaders, and school district officials to help them develop classroom practices and school cultures that foster confidence, uh, self-esteem, and academic success among all students. He holds a PhD in social and cultural studies and education, and a Bachelor of Arts degree in literature, both from UC Berkeley. So thank you so much uh, to Jeff, and please welcome. Good morning. That's way better than my high school class. Um, <clears throat> so the, the talk that I was asked to, to do today uh, is really emerged uh, probably about 18 months ago as the result of uh, work that I've been doing for the last five to seven years uh, pretty consistently, um, which is I, I'm consistently getting called by districts, by schools, by um, charter groups, uh, by orgs like Google, um, like Facebook, to um, help them think through their equity plans or their equity efforts. So I'm in a room full of educators and I'm quite certain that your district or um, school group is also now all about equity. Um, because this is okay, the difference between equality and equity. Now, the boy that I'm talking about is Amaru. Okay? And Amaru is constantly thirsty, so much so that this dude literally will drop a straw into anything to try to extract liquid. Okay? In this particular case, he struck gold. That's a coconut. He's got a straw in. And Tayari 
is constantly hungry. Okay, so much so that this dude will literally store morsels of food on his shirt for later snacking. <laughs> this is a picture of our family, first time out the house, literally, first time out the house after the boys were born. Anybody here have multiples? Okay, so you know exactly what I'm talking about. That's real talk, isn't it? That's literally the first time we made it out of the house. Everybody else is like, oh, come, no, for real. Okay. <laughs> so we're at... Uh, Anybody here from Oakland? Okay, so, so y'all would know that this, this is the lake, right? This is Lake Merritt, very common uh, gathering place for folks from the community. So we're out at the lake, and community members walk up and say, hey, 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 can you take a picture of the family? It's our first time out. Can you take so he snaps this photo and hands me my phone back. And I'm looking at the phone, put the boys down, looking at the phone, and I'm like, what the hell is that? <laughs> I said, Tayari, come here, boy, come here. I call him over, and that is bark from that tree. <laughs> so when I tell you that my son is constantly hungry, we're literally talking about a young brother that will pull bark off of trees and eat it. Okay, so in this context, is this equal? Okay, so you, you, went, you, went right, you went right to no, okay? So wh why are you saying no? They're getting the same thing, but they're not really getting, they're not getting what Whoa, 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 whoa. Is this equal? Yes, yes, they're getting the same thing. Oh, now you want to change your answer. <laughs> Just make sure you let kids do the same thing. Okay. So anybody here say this is not equal? Okay, in the back. Why do you say this is not equal? They're getting the same thing, but they're not getting the same thing. Your son that drinks will drink the whole thing, and your son that eats a lot will drink a lot. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so why is that not equal? See, your problem, and your problem, and all those that you went straight to know, your problem is that you ignored the question. In point of fact, you actually changed the question. You changed the question from is this equal to is this fair? But that's not what I asked you. I asked you is this equal? And this is the dictionary definition of equal. It is in every way equal.